but I'd, I'd like now to uh, introduce two other panellists, um, Professor uh, Jenny Shaw uh, and Dr Jackie uh, Dyer. Uh, Dr Jackie Dyer is the independent health and social care consultant who has lived experience and a background in adult mental health commissioning, uh, as well as community uh, and family social work and Professor Jenny Shaw, who's a professor in forensic psychiatry at the University of Manchester with interests in homicide, uh, suicide, uh, violence, risk and offender healthcare. And she's head of uh, homicide uh, research at the National Confidential uh, Inquiry. Um, so Jackie, I just wondered if you could say um, uh, a little bit about uh, the work that you've been involved in, uh, and then we'll hand over to Jenny uh, to talk about her work, uh, particularly in, in homicide. So over to you, Jackie, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> so um, thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, so the work that I'm involved in really is about um, improving our understanding of how to work with uh, racialized communities in terms of mental health services. So I am NHS England Mental Health Equalities Advisor and um, have that same role with Health Education England. Um, I am the director of Black Thrive Global and I'm also a local politician, but essentially I'm a lived expert by experience um, who has um, lost two siblings who have spent uh, nearly 30 years in mental health care. And so, so some of this report was really actually quite triggering for me um, because when I think of the suicide attempts, not only mine, but actually by my brothers, um, and the um, the sort of really lethal ways that they 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 attempted to take their lives, um, it just brings great great sadness that um, mental health services weren't really able to respond properly to those risk factors. Um, and uh, I lost my uh, most recent brother six days after George Floyd died last year. So within that context, it's really still quite painful and I'm still experiencing the grief if, if, if you know. So yeah, so the report is interesting in highlighting some of those differential experiences um, in terms of risk factors and experiences. So uh, yeah, that's me. Thanks, Jackie. and. Um... Jenny, do you want to say a few words about some of the work you've been involved in? Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, so as has been, has been mentioned, I uh, lead the homicide part of the inquiry, which is, uh, as Lewis said, is nowadays much reduced. Um, but we've also been developing the work in, in other areas with other grant applications. For example, we've really uh, recently put forward some research to look at the reasons why more people with severe mental illness uh, who perpetrate homicide are going to prison compared with previously. And we've also uh, developed some work looking at potential interventions for those involved in knife crimes. Um, as you've mentioned, uh, my probably my main focus is on prison mental health and uh, suicide and self-harm across the criminal justice pathway. And we're uh, just starting to do some work uh, in relation to prisons uh, and COVID and uh, that sort of looking at some factors which may explain differing rates of self-harm in prisons over the COVID period. Um, I'm also a panel member of the Independent Advisory Panel for Deaths in Custody. Thank you. Lovely, thanks Jenny. So we've had lots of um, people asking us uh, this morning about the um, access to uh, slides. Uh, and links to the various reports uh, mentioned. And just to say that all the slides uh, and links will be on the website at NKISH um, website later on uh, this week. So do look out for those. Um, we've had some wonderful questions come through, really rich questions. And I'm confident that we're not gonna get through all of them in the next half an hour. But what I am also confident about is that um, 
the team will be answering those questions via Twitter. So look at um, the Twitter under the hashtag, uh, hashtag NKISH2021 uh, and follow NKISH on at NKISH under stroke UK. So we will get back to everybody. So I don't want anyone to, to be going away feeling really disappointed that their questions not being answered. So um, a, a number of um, uh, questions, uh, and I'm going to start off uh, with um, one for you, Steve. We've heard about um, response to, um, you know, of services, and there have been some really interesting questions uh, come through about that, and, and so many wonderful comments about the power of, of, of your opening talk. But this question is for you. Is the one thing that you found really helpful that a uh, mental health professional did when you were feeling at your worst that you could share? Yeah, it's very, it's very simple. Um, listen, uh, it's quite interesting kind of reading through uh, the chat and somebody said of the 10 steps that, that active listening wasn't one of those. And I, I told that story of being in the doctor's waiting room. And the reason I tell that is that as, as someone that works a lot with, with clinicians, I really understand that you're going from seeing someone that's got a bunion on their foot to someone that's got a bad back to someone that's heading suicidal crisis. But you've got to understand that there is a whole context before that person even gets to the door. And I'm not saying that there is a magic wand that you can wave in 10 minutes. Um, in a GP surgery, if you end up in A&E, there's no magic wand. If you're part of a, a, you know, a community mental health team, it, it's the same thing. But what you can do at every single moment is you can look that person in the eye and you can say, I'm with you. There's no skill involved. There's no cost involved. There's, there's also no obligation that in doing so, that you are responsible for keeping me alive. Louis has spoken really well to the complexity of, of, of suicide, um, the complexity of how we understand the data, how we understand people's experiences. But let's just be human. Let's sit there. Let's let that person know, I'm with you, and we are going to do absolutely everything we can to get you through this. Lovely. Thank you, um, Steve. And I'm really glad that you brought that other comment uh, into it. So that was a sort of challenge really to the, the panel uh, about, you know, why isn't active listening on the, the kind of list of, 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 of 10 things? Uh, I guess that's maybe something that we all kind of take for granted, but maybe we absolutely shouldn't in our systems and, 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 and services. Okay, can I uh, explain why it isn't? Um, it's, uh, it's a that's a summary of a series of studies where we have to ask services what they do and what they don't do. Um, and there are some things that will always give you the answer yes. And one of them is, are you nice to people? Um, so it, um, so, so the, the study is about, um, it's actually quite a complicated study, so I won't try and explain it all, but, but essentially we were tracking the, the change in the configuration of services. So what did they actually provide? And we had to, we, we didn't want to take their word for it. So we wanted to say, Sorry to anybody who answered our questions. It's not that we didn't believe you, but it was that we wanted to be certain that when people said, well, we've got an outreach team or we've got early follow-up, that, that, that there was a reason why they said it. So it was it written down in policy um, or something like that. So, so, it was a, um, so it's, it, it's definitely not the only 10 things that you should do in order to, to, work, uh, to, to work on suicide prevention. But it does tell you, if you were working as, a, say, a medical director or chief executive, remember a lot of the, our audience is people who are running services very often um, or leading services. Um, it, it is saying to you that here are, here are 10 things. If, if you want to get started on suicide prevention, prevention, here are the 10 things that your service uh, should be doing. Um, but while, while I've got the for you, can I just mention that the, um, Steve's given a really good answer um, to, to your question. I, I've got a, um, a related but slightly different answer, which is that is to take people seriously. So I suppose it relates to the issue of listening because, you know, the two are connected. But, but um, time and again, we hear about people who report feeling suicidal or desperate and they're, they're 
uh, even when they're listened to. They sometimes are not taken seriously. Now, you know, I, I'm not a clinician now, but I've been a, I was a clinician for 20 years. And, and I do understand why people sometimes have to make judgments about degree of risk and so on. But when people tell you that they're thinking about suicide or self-harm, take it seriously. And so many times we hear from young people saying they didn't really believe it or, or saying, well, we've decided your risk is low. Majority of patients who die by suicide have been thought to be low risk. That's the reality. And, and so, so taking risk seriously, I think, is, uh, is critical from my point of view. Great, thanks. Thanks, Lewis. So really uh, clear messages uh, there about what us clinicians on the front line absolutely need to do, which is listening and taking people seriously. And the, the toolkit is uh, 10 things based on research that we can all do to improve services. Uh, but it's not the only things that we should be doing. And please, uh, uh, it's not a competition which should be on the, on the, on the list of things that, that, that we all do. The, the, there's another question for you, uh, Steve, as well. And I know that we have a number of people who work um, in the voluntary sector with us uh, today. And uh, that's a question uh, particularly about the Samaritans. I have a lot of respect for that organisation. My mum used to um, volunteer for them when I was growing up. I suspect that the fact that I had an educational dad and a Samaritan mum probably ended up uh, uh, creating my destiny to become a psychiatrist who's interested in uh, teaching and training. Um, but Steve, at any time did you think about or, or, or use um, organisations like the Samaritans? Where were they for you in, in all of this? I didn't... I didn't really cool samaritans um we did so so again i think there's there's, a, there's a, a context to these early suicidal experiences were 2008 2009 and the world was completely different so it wasn't for want of trying we just couldn't seem to find the places and i, I remember i found one one third sector organization bear in mind i lived in birmingham so it wasn't like i was uh, somewhere tiny and i think i was just about to age out um and they told me it was going to be six to eight weeks before i could see somebody i couldn't see six hours down the line six to eight weeks might have been ne just as, as never the interesting thing about samaritans so I, part of the reason i didn't speak to them was i didn't think they were for me but actually i i reference um Kathy, what I didn't realize at the time was that Kathy was getting off the phone from speaking with me for hours, and then she, in the end, was calling them because she'd kind of reached the point where she didn't know what to do anymore. So it's kind of one removed, but they were there, and I, you know, and I'm incredibly thankful that they were there um, because not only, and I, and I think, you know, we talk about the number of deaths it's 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 horrific to think how many people die by suicide but then we have to think of the ripples that go out even though i didn't die Kath, she's never fully explained to me what it was like to have to support me there's a degree of trauma there that she has and she never will she will never explain what that was like so the fact that Samaritans and, you know, and other third sector organizations up and down the country are there to support those people is not only something that we should recognize, it's something that we need to, we need to think about how we fund effectively, how we make sure that they are supported um, and that we don't just see them as being nice to have, they're essential because that's what kept me alive. And I'm brilliant, so... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We've, we've heard a lot today about um, access to service, and I think you, you described that very eloquently, Steve, about feeling that, that you know, bits of services and, and, and organisations were not for you. And uh, we've heard very powerfully uh, as well from uh, NAV's um, uh, work about accessing services, particularly psychological therapies, uh, for men, and I'm, I'm really interested to hear uh, some more about that as well. But, but Jackie, you are uh, one of the experts in this area about people being excluded from uh, services, and um, particularly 
uh, because of their um, uh, heritage and, and, and racial background. And I just wondered if you wanted to say a bit about what we should be doing uh, to make our services uh, welcoming to everybody and, and, and that our communities um, uh, are able to reach out for help when they, they need it, because they certainly aren't at the moment and uh, there's an awful lot of work to be done. So I'm pretty struck by the data that, is it a third, I can't remember the exact stat, uh, people who are with uh, are in contact with services, mental health services, um, and that, um, yeah, that kind of light ratio. But I'm really interested, and, and we can talk here about the different ways, and some has been illustrated about the different ways that we can uh, better identify and support people when they're in that level of distress in terms of like the mental health uh, professions. I'm sort of really quite interested in those that are not engaged with those services. And I think some reference to that um, in terms of the voluntary sector is, is, is one aspect. Um, but I, I think that um, I know many people actually just in my own liberty who would not engage with any of those services, even the voluntary sector or statutory mental health services, um, because um, from a, a racialized perspective, um, these services are not safe um, um, based on um, the sort of knowledge that um, um, around care treatment and outcomes for um, racialized communities. Um, so, um, in one's anguish and distress, who would you go to? I think about, say, for example, like my mum when um, and my sister, when my brother, the first time my brother tried to take his life, when he actually um, uh, slit his throat. And um, where did we go? Where did we know where to go in that urgency was immediately uh, around uh, A and E. Um, but um, the trauma in relation to our family's experience of that, and um, there was nowhere to go. We don't know of anywhere to go. And that's kind of the thing that's really there. Um, and also that that particular experience from my brother was the first of many very uh, serious attempts to end his life. And that um, gap that exists uh, when somebody holds a comorbidity uh, or multiple morbidity indeed, and that's especially prevalent within um, uh, communities of colour, uh, holding multiple morbidities, and the thoughts or the su suicidal ideation and where that goes, but even the evidence of that's been your history and how that's attended to is kind of somehow lost in sort of siloed uh, sort of like responses. And unfortunately for my brother, his needs were never really met in relation to the degree of suicide ideation that he lived with throughout his life. Um, and that's really very troubling to me, um, but he was engaged with services. But I know many people, friends that I have, um, that whilst they have these thoughts, make attempts, um, they would not reach out to the current services as they exist. So there's something about uh, much deeper work that needs to be done around um, uh, making sure our services are not uh, 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 anti-discriminatory essentially. And some of that work is being done via um, the, I lead on developing the national framework for the patient and care race equality framework, which will be rolled out nationally uh, next year. Um, and I think within those contexts, um, stakeholders, including the voluntary sector, as well as um, statutory services, need to be much more robust in terms of how we relate to diverse uh, communities that have a differential risk profile, as I as ex, ex, explained within this report, and that sort of overlaps in that intersectionality with what uh, middle-aged men might have, knowing that in terms of post uh, during COVID and the, the elevated economic issues that we that are already prevalent within uh, those communities, um, escalate some of these these challenges.
Thanks, Jackie. And I, I, you know, I think the clear message there is about perceptions of, of, of services and about safety and, you know, a real um, call to action, I think, for, for, for those of us in services to really see this through an anti-discriminatory lens. I, I think it's something that's just not really um, talked about or even thought about. Um, we kind of assume uh, uh, far too much about our services. You know, we, 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 we think, you know, that, 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 that we're doing good, that we're there for, for, for everybody, but actually the, the harsh reality is that we're not, uh, and we're certainly uh, not seen like that. So, so, so thank you for that. And I just wondered if you could move over to now because it sort of touches on the findings from from your report, Nav, on uh, you know suicide in middle aged men, and this really worrying um, statistic that I think only five percent um, were were engaged in psychological therapies. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to say a bit about that. I mean, I'm always struck by the fact that our psychological therapy services are, um, you know, attract a workforce from a very particular um, background. They're largely female, they're largely white, they're largely um, highly educated and, and, and from higher socioeconomic um, groups. And, you know, what should we be doing with our services to make them uh, more accessible to middle-aged yeah. men? I think it's a, a really important point. I'll just pick up quickly on one of the things Jackie said, though. It's about the group who aren't in contact. And, and there, I think it's about kind of innovation. It's about trying to find men where they are. So, you know, colleagues around the country, you know, who are, who are here at this event today, you know, they've been doing all sorts of things, reaching men through sport, reaching men through baking, uh, reaching men through kind of, um, uh, you know, variety of different means. So that, that bit's important. But I think what's new about our report is, you know, actually the, 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 the surprise really for us that actually so many men are in contact with services. And I think that the psychological therapies um, data are really interesting. I mean, first of all, it could be a bit of an underestimate because remember, we're looking at routine data sources, coroner's records. So it may be that some men are in, in touch with psychological treatment services, but that's not been recorded. Um, but the, I think there is a, a real um, point about, you know, whether existing models, whether whether IAPT is, is really kind of fit for, for purpose. In terms of the research, there's not huge amounts out there. We we don't there isn't really an evidence base it as as such, although I know um, some of the people in the in the chat have uh, recommended kind of uh, resources that are out there. We we have to tailor things. So kind of there have been various reviews thinking about how we take into account, you know, concepts of masculinity, how we take into account social norms when we're providing therapy, how we obviously, the, you know, the obvious thing that everyone talks about is, is kind of um, moda modality of therapy. So, you know, are men more likely uh, to engage with kind of online therapy rather than face to face? I, I, I personally don't know what the evidence is around that, but we, we need to explore all modalities of getting in, in touch with people. There's some research out there that um, uh, therapy with men needs to be kind of quite, quite kind of goal focused. Again, that's not, not been repl replicated. And um, I think some therapists use particular techniques when they work with men in order to engage them that we could, we could probably, um, probably kind of um, learn with. So Kate mentioned, you know, the, the um, idea of kind of identification with the therapist. So he's a kind of therapist, the same as you, but the, the idea that, you know, sometimes self-disclosure in, in psychological therapies for men might be more effective, but this is all quite tenuous. And I think we need to do a lot more work um, to better engage men in our services. I think that's one of the big messages here. Lovely, thanks, uh, Nav. And, and I guess, um, you know, within that really um, striking finding in your research, it, would appear that there are been you know many opportunities to uh, to to reach out to people to to, to connect uh, in more effective ways than, than than maybe had had happened and you know possible missed opportunity there's a, a question about would suicide first aid training for gps and practice staff be a useful um step forward um do you want to answer that one as well Nav? I can do. I think Jenny and Steve will maybe want yeah. to come in on the okay. uh, on the mental health access point. So maybe take that first. Lovely. Okay. Uh, over to you, Jenny. 
Yes, I, just a brief point. I, I was very struck having done clinics in prison for many years that, again, there's a group of very disadvantaged people who often haven't had contact with services, don't want to have contact with services, make contact in prison, but then trying to regain contact with services um, on release from prison is extremely difficult. And often they hit the same issues, you know, of, of, of services not wanting to engage. I was very struck with what Jackie said about the issue of comorbidity, uh, which that group have uh, as well. And it's often very difficult to engage them with services back in the community. Thanks, Jenny. And, and, and Steve, you wanted to come back with a, a, a comment about access. Yeah. Um, I think the word is clunky. I think at the point when somebody makes an attempt on their life, it's clearly a medical issue. But I think as uh, as when uh, Louis was uh, exploring the, uh, the the experience of middle aged men, oh sorry, uh, Nath was looking at the experience of middle aged men. There are lots of social factors. Actually, suicide is as much a consequence of social disconnection as it is medical and i think that the part of the problem is is that we come at it from a a, a medical perspective first when actually part of this is so e so even as someone that, that is in recovery i still have to go to a hospital for my outpatient appointments when medicalizing recovery let alone anything to do with suicide prevention and i think what's quite interesting is and this is slightly left uh, left field but in Birmingham, when they were doing the 0 to 25 year old um, service, they designed a drop in center with the young people. And they said to the young people, What do you want it to look like? And they said, We want it to feel like a combination between an Apple store and Starbucks. So you go in there, and that's what it feels like. There's no front desk, there's no kind of waiting room area. It's just soft plus chairs, you have iPads you know, deck to people wearing t-shirts saying, how can I help you? Now, I'm not saying that's the exact same model we need for men or that that's the exact same model we need for black men. But you know what? You know you know where, where black men are? They're everywhere. Some of them are in the barbershops. Some of them are in the workplace. Some of them are at sports clubs. And I think part of the challenge is, is that we, we almost buy into this, men are really difficult to, to speak to. Black men are really difficult to speak to. Actually, that's not necessarily the case. And I think we need to kind of expand our timeline. And for me, and this is the biggest challenge to all of us, is suicide prevention is not somebody from, from taking their own life at that moment. That is certainly part of it. But it's never seeing the crisis. So this is about how we fundamentally see all of our roles in social care, in, in being a really supportive society. Because I didn't know where to go to to speak to somebody i couldn't speak to my friends that was all those years ago that hasn't changed dramatically in the years since thanks thanks steve um and nav um this question about you, you know when people do come into contact with with, with our with, with current systems and, and, and services uh, and, and and steve's point about you know innovation is 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 absolutely well made but but for, for the people that are going to their their gps would first aid and uh, uh, you know mental health first aid and and, and suicide uh, training help do you think? I, I, I think there's a more fundamental point actually and, and steve's kind of uh, raised it and I, I i loved your word clunky and so did um a lot of our delegates actually i loved your word clunky and and so what's the solution to clunky uh, the solution to clunky is easing the transitions between different bits of the service um, and ensuring kind of great communication across different bits of the service. So I think that in a way is more important. So one of the things we are grappling with, and I think is one of the big challenges in suicide and self-harm prevention is the role of primary care. You know, 80% of men have been in touch with their general practitioner at some point in that study. What, but primary care has to deal with everything, you know, every conceivable uh, uh, thing primary care is dealing with. So the challenge is what we do. And, and when we've talked to general practitioners, you know, yes, of course, it's about training. Of course, of course, absolutely. It's about compassionate care when, when someone presents. 
but it's also about seamless systems. So have they got places to refer to? Have they got access to the psychological therapy they desperately want for their patients? So the training's important, the understanding's important, but the systems are important. And Steve's absolutely right. And, and we never say it's just about health systems. We never say it's just a health problem. You know, the importance of community, uh, the importance of socioeconomic factors, you know, is kind of central to the work. It's just, you know, we happen to work in a health service context. And I, I don't know if Lewis wants to say any more about that. Uh, well, Nav, I agree with everything you say, as you know, but um, that, that, so that was uh, really good. I, I, I though, uh, when it comes to talking about ethnic minorities, I mean, the, the big, big focus of this report is ethnic minorities, one of the main themes of the report. Um, and it's not, it's not a, and, and partly that's been prompted by COVID, uh, where to an extent the, the, the brunt of COVID, certainly in some communities, has been felt by uh, minority communities. And the, um, the so uh, and the men, therefore the mental health consequences may, may also be felt that way too. So that was our concern. That's why we wanted to talk about it in this report. But you know, um, uh, for me, I I'm, it, I find it um, sort of wearying and embarrassing that we are still talking about this. Um, I, I, I when we when I started training in psychiatry in the 1980s, we were talking then about creating a more culturally sensitive. Uh, service and here we are. I'm, I'm um, well. I hesitate to say I'm reaching the sort of later part of my career, but I might be. And uh, uh, and, and we're still talking about it. Uh, and we, we're still talking about cultural sensitivity. We're still talking about training people. We're still describing people getting direct experience of racism, a system that doesn't work for a diverse society. And it's quite incredible that that is still the conversation. And uh, I, I can, I, I sense J Jack and Steve's frustration that that is still where the conversation lies. And uh, and the and if there's one positive thing about the the, the whole um, George Floyd tragedy, is that it's made us, it's shaken us up a bit and said, all of those of us, all those of us who think that our, our services and our, our philosophy has been evolving, we're doing a better job, we've taken it all seriously. Suddenly, we had to stop and say, well, that, that maybe isn't what's happened, that this, this is still the issue that is blighting the way we provide care. Um, and it becomes the responsibility of every public service, every, every service, but every public service in particular, to look at what it's been doing and what its assumptions have been about how it tackles issues of race equality. And I don't think the message will be a very positive one. And, and what, so what do you do? Um, well, you need the things that Jackie was talking about but, and Steve was talking about, but it's also about leadership. Uh, and that leadership is partly political. It's also in the media. It's in the service that we, um, that many of us are, you know, have a sort of leadership role in. But 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 getting getting that right, and and and, and that sense that we are dealing with a whole set of individuals, and the and the move towards seeing risk and safety and suicide and so on as an individual issue, where we support individuals with the complexity of their individual lives, not a category of, of human being that we've decided needs something else. Um, I, I, that individualism is where, for me, is where we, we need to head. Thanks. And Jackie, do you want to come back? So I, I, I just want to I hear what um, uh, Louise is saying. I think it's a combination of being able to see the individual in the wider context of their whole liberty. So that's where you now understand them in terms of their adverse childhood experiences, for example, in combination with other features which emerge from structural inequities and inequalities. If anything that George Floyd has shown us and that the COVID impact has shown us, it's that we need to pay better attention in the way that Louise has uh, sort of articulated. I also don't want us to lose like some of the other um, findings from the report, which is around younger people, and around um, the, and, and another point that um, uh, Jennifer mentioned, which is around um, the, the, the component around violence. Um, I think that we have to understand that this is much more complicated um, set of factors impacting on an individual than just purely a kind of medical lens. Although the role that the medical um, element play in that wider um, response is absolutely critical and therefore the upskilling is, 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 is really, really critical. But there are elements which are around um, 
if we talk about the economic impact, the economic adversity, um, people feeling lonely, da da da, all these things interacting um, speak to that there are other parts of the system that need attending to um, in order to create the conditions where people's uh, uh, levels of risk are not so elevated to go down this this particular uh, 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 road. Um, and yeah, and, and, and so from, so for me, from where I sit, two things. One is that, what is it about my brothers or my, 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 the brother that more recently passed that meant that he was not seen as suitable for psychological therapies. So even though his worst fear, which led to his suicide ideation to get away from a thought, which was that he's going to die and burn in everlasting fire. Um, that did not warrant or trigger actually some psychological intervention would be supportive of you. And that never happened. And that's actually a racialized experience that that intervention is not found worthy for somebody who's got comorbidity and da 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 that's that's one thing and then the other thing is how do all of the different spokes of our system work in 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 in, in a way where there is cross fertilization and learning um because so from a political perspective, as a deputy leader of, of, of Lambeth Council, how do I um, create the conditions, say for example, around employment, access to employment and education and so forth, um, so that those more risk, those groups that are at risk actually find the pipelines to deal with some of the factors that are creating the conditions where they are feeling more like they want to escape their lives. So there's a kind of, um, wh what's the learning about what we need to do in other areas in order to help along with um, some of the um, ideas that have been shared here today. Brilliant. Well, thanks, uh, Jackie, and, and thanks to all our um, uh, panelists. Um, as I predicted, we uh, have run out of time. I think we could continue this conversation uh, for at least uh, a, a day or two. There's so many uh, rich uh, uh, discussion points uh, to be had. Uh, and thanks to the team who'll be answering the unanswered questions and putting them out on Twitter uh, later on today and throughout the week. So thank you uh, to all our speakers, to uh, Steve Gilbert, OBE, Professors Lewis Appleby, uh, Nav Kapoor, and our expert panelists, Dr. Jackie Dyer and Professor Jenny Shaw, for what's been a highly uh, informative and as ever, a clear update on the very latest findings of the National Confidential Inquiry into Suicide and Safety and Mental Health. So thank you to all of them for what I'm confident will have been a well-received presentations. There's so much for us all to take away and reflect on, especially thinking about the needs and importantly unmet needs of the populations that we serve, focusing on young people presenting with complexity, people known to primary care and mental health services, people living alone, people from diverse ethnic uh, minority backgrounds and middle-aged men. Thank you too uh, for a rich and stimulating uh, discussion and thank you to the audience for your thoughtful and searching questions and for your continuing interest and support of the work of NKISH. For those of us who run mental health services across systems today, we've been served a challenge. And as Professor Sir Michael Marmot said yesterday at the Royal College of Psychiatrists International uh, Congress, when he was talking about tackling health inequalities, we need to do something, we need to do more, and we need to do better. And whilst having given us a challenge, NKISH also gives us roadmaps and resources and the very clear pointers based on decades of research are there in plain sight with a 10 steps toolkit to improve safety for people under mental health services by reducing alcohol and substance misuse, creating safer wards, early follow-up on discharge. 
um, moving uh, towards having no out of area admissions, providing 24 hour crisis teams, involving families in learning lessons uh, from suicide, providing clear guidance on depression, personalizing risk management. And we've heard a lot about that today, providing outreach uh, teams and creating importantly, environments and cultures within our systems where there's low staff turnover uh, and people are able to bring their uh, true selves to work. And behind the scenes supporting this work is a fantastic team at Enkish who've achieved a huge contribution to moving our understanding forward during the challenges of the pandemic, which has affected everyone at every level of their lives. So in addition to thanking Lewis, Nav and Jenny, I also wanted to say a special thank you to the rest of the team who've continued this work from spare bedrooms, kitchen tables and schools at home over the last 16 months. So to Pauline, Carol, Nicola, Alison, Lana, Isabel, Saeed, the other Nicola, Catherine, Sugwan, James, Huma, Julie, Rebecca and Philip. Thank you for everything you've all done to make this work happen. And thank you to uh, uh, our commissioners at HQIP, the Health Quality Improvement Partnership, with it, without whom none of this work would happen. And finally, I wanted to honour the people who've lost their lives to suicide over the lifetime of this inquiry. Over the last two decades, this state stands at 144. 100,000 people who have, uh, sorry, uh, who have, sorry, 144,000 uh, people who have died. There are absolutely no words that can describe the immense suffering, tragedy and loss of each and every one. It can be easy to get lost behind the statistics, but behind every one is a life cut short and so many missed opportunities. So I thought I'd finish by reading a poem by Maya Angelou, the American civil rights activist, poet and author, who was familiar with suffering and struggle in her own life. When Great Trees Fall by Maya Angelou. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder, lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity, our memory suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die and our reality bound to them takes leave of us. Our souls dependent on their nurture now shrink, wizened. Our minds formed and informed by their radiance fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die after a period, Peace blooms, slowly and always irregularly. Spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restored, never to be the same, whisper to us. They existed, they existed. We can be, be and be better, for they existed. Thank you very much. <laughs>